All right, what's up, OCAM? So today's lab, uh, preparation of aspirin from salicylic acid. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid because we're basically adding an acetyl functional group to, uh, or an acetyl group to the phenol portion of a salicylic acid. So phenol, remember, is a benzene ring with an OH on it. So it's like an alcohol, okay? Now, um, lots of stuff we want to learn today. So. Um, some heating techniques, basically uh, heating in a conical vial with an air reflux condenser. Um, and then in addition to that, we're going to be calculating our limiting reagents as well as our um, theoretical yield and actual yield for this particular reaction when all is said and done. Um, and in addition to that, what we will be doing is kind of... Um, Going over a little bit of crystallization again, we will be crystallizing our product uh, to obtain a more pure substance because uh, after the reaction is done, we'll have some leftover acetic acid, phosphoric acid, uh, there's going to be some, some other stuff in there, maybe, maybe um, some starting material or what have you. So um, really, after that's done, what we're going to do is test the purity of our material with um, the ferric chloride test and the melting point. So the melting point, we already know that. We're, we, we know that the melting point gets depressed when we have an impure sample. So we're going to see where we lie on that. Um, in addition to that, we will that ferric chloride test is basically a test to determine. It's a qualitative test, first of all, not quantitative. So all we're doing is testing for the presence of salicylic acid with ferric chloride. So um, all we do is add a drop of ferric chloride to, um, and then if it turns purple, you would think a beautiful color like purple would be a good thing, but in this case it's not. So ferric chloride, um, so the iron cation in there does react and form a metal complex with the phenol in basically any phenol, but in this case, it's the phenol on salicylic acid. So if it does form that, it makes a beautiful purple color. Uh, and that means we do have salicylic acid present. Now, the quantity of salicylic acid is not going to be clear. You can't really say just because it's dark or light that you have a lot or a little of salicylic acid just because we're basically eyeballing how much sample we put in there. So it's a qualitative test. If it's purple, we have salicylic acid present. So therefore, it's not necessarily perfectly pure. It's totally common, especially in the human environment that we work in in Santa Barbara. Um, but just something to be aware of, okay? So let's take a look at kind of like what we're doing. Um, the chemical reaction scheme as well as some other little tidbits of information, okay? All right, y'all, so today is, here's the lecture or some information on um, the preparation of aspirin, which is the today's lab. And so really what I'm drawing out is of the reaction scheme. So we have salicylic acid combined with acetic anhydride, and this combines with an... Uh, a catalytic amount of acid catalyst. So uh, in this case, it's going to be H3PO4. And then we get our product, acetyl salicylic acid, which is the aspirin, okay? So, uh, okay, underneath all of these, uh, well, at least salicylic acid, I have the mass of uh, 138.1 grams per mole. I have acetic acid 102.1, as well as a density of 1.08 grams per milliliter. And then aspirin is 180.2 grams per mole. And um, the acid catalyst is not important because what goes in comes out. That's the idea of a catalyst. And so um, I really just want to point out the fact that the purpose of this concentrated phosphoric acid is basically to create um, a lower activation energy for the reaction, which means that the speed or the rate of this reaction is gonna be much faster um, and it's gonna require less heat. So we can heat it to like 50 degrees like we are, as opposed to like 100 or 200. And it's also going to be much faster than if we were to leave the phosphoric acid out. 
of the reaction, okay? And so this is typical for catalytic reactions. Um, it is in equilibrium as well. And so it can go left and right and... Um, <clears throat> All right, so another thing that we have to do today is uh, calculate the theoretical yield, right? And so this is exactly why I gave you the molar masses as well as the um, density of acetic anhydride. So let's say, hypothetically, we had 100 milligrams of salicylic acid. I'm going to abbreviate that SA. Uh, and then we also had let's say, I don't know, 200 um, microliters of acetic anhydride, AA, um, how much product are we going to get? How much acetic acetyl salicylic acid, ASA, are we going to get? So what we need to do is determine, in, determine the limiting reagent. And so the way we do that is basically figure out the moles we know that for every one mole of salicylic acid and one mole of acetic anhydride, we get one mole of product. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So basically all we have to do is determine um, which compound has the, le the smallest amount of moles in this case. And so the way we would do that is um, convert our 200 microliters to uh, 0 0.200 milliliters. Then we can multiply that by 1.08 grams per mil. And we can multiply that by the reciprocal of the molar mass, 102.1 grams per one mole of right, right? Here, so um, that basically cancels out our mils, cancels out our grams. I'll put AA here, sorry. And then we've got our okay. And now what we also want to do is convert our zero point, or sorry, our 100 milligrams of salicylic acid that goes to 0 0.100 grams of salicylic acid. And then we can multiply by the reciprocal of the molar mass, 138.1 grams of salicylic acid per one mole of salicylic acid. Those cancel out and then we get moles of salicylic acid, right? I'm gonna let you do that math, uh, but I'm just showing you how to do the calculation because uh, Word on the street is, that's helpful. So um, in addition to that, I'll, I mean, I'm also not gonna show you how to do this conversion because this conversion, um, we should know that already from general chemistry. Um, and then once we've determined that, let's just say in this case, um, we got, I'm gonna do another hypothetical. Well, that's that might confuse you, so. Let me just, let's, without even calculating the, um, the m number of moles of acetic anhydride, let's just assume salicylic acid is our guy. So 0 0.1 divided by 138.1 equals 0 0.0007241 moles of salicylic acid. Okay, so <clears throat> that means that we would multiply that by... Uh, one mole of acetyl salicylic acid per one mole of salicylic acid, and that means that we would have 0 0.0007241 uh, moles of acetyl salicylic acid multiply by the 180, multiply by the molar mass, 180.2 grams of ASA per one mole of ASA. And so that's 180.2. I got 0 0.130. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Acid. So we started with about 100 milligrams of salicylic acid, and then we should get more in terms of mass just because the mass of the product is greater, and we've actually added this acetyl functional group 
uh, or this portion of the molecule. That's why it's called acetyl salicylic acid. Okay. Now, um, it's one another thing I wanted to kind of touch up on was this a actual reaction is called a Fischer esterification, and it's typically done with alcohols plus. Um, let's just do acetic acid in this case. And then we have our H plus. And what we end up getting is our desired ester product. But we also get water because this guy right here and this guy right here end up piecing out as water. And so water is a byproduct. But um, turns out that esters in the presence of water, hence the, the equilibrium, can actually go back to the alcohol and the carboxylic acid. Okay, so the water does pose a problem, and generally in a lab, we might, we may or may not. Uh, employ methods to remove this water either with some sort of drying agent or something called a Dean Stark which you'll, will, you'll be, will be introduced at another time uh, but either way just wanted to point out the fact that water sucks Gatorade's better I mean water's not good uh, for chemical reactions that require the that result in the loss of that product if they're equilibrium because uh, the presence of water inherently allows it to move backwards and form the decomposition product okay so this would just be the decomposition uh, of uh, an ester in the presence of water and this is exactly what happens to acetyl salicylic acid or acid happens in our stomach because we do have stomach acids right and obviously water and so uh, it turns out that this guy is actually the active component in our body that so basically um, prostaglandins are kind of compounds in our body that um, are involved involved in the body's immune response so anytime there's like something going on that your body doesn't like it um, prostaglandins are involved in a physiological process that um, kind of evokes pain or fevers or maybe local inflammation and so aspirin ha is actually believed to uh, inactivate one of the enzymes that are responsible for the synthesis of prostaglandins and so specifically arachidonic acid and so that's kind of how the function of salicylic acid works and um, some pretty cool stuff Arachidonic acid is a crazy structure. Let me actually just draw this for you just because it's fun. Boom. 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 I'm just going to draw it, okay? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Something like that. Um, whoops. We got to add some double bonds in here. Um, and this is arachidonic acid all right all right what we've got here is the ingredients and equipment to get the party started so what i've done here is i've already weighed out that solid powder that's salicylic acid that's 0 0.208 grams or 208 milligrams of salicylic acid you're going to need that number to calculate your limiting reagent as well as your theoretical yield um, in the end. <clears throat> and then I have uh, on that same uh, piece of paper, I have my spin vein, which will go inside of my 5 mil conical vial, which then gets this guy set on top, right? And so I'll explain that in a minute, but we have a pipette to add our drop of phosphoric acid. We've got our uh, Eppendorf um, micropipetter to add our acetic anhydride. Uh, we're going to be adding 480 microliters, aka 0 0.480 milliliters. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the setup of the hot water bath. So what I've done is I already started this. Oh, let's check that temperature. 
So I'll turn that on. It's at 51.5 degrees Celsius, as you can see. Boom, we want it at 50 degrees. That's actually perfect. We don't want it too high, too low, above 50 degrees, but as you can see, I set this up before I even got everything else ready to go. And that's exactly what you want to do. This is the first thing I set up coming into the lab. I got my clamp. And then another important thing is that thermometer is not touching the bottom of that hot water bath. And so that's what you want uh, as well. You want that set up to where it's testing the temperature of the water and not the hot, um, the hot plate essentially, okay? So let's go ahead and um, go ahead and get this reaction started. We're only heating it for 10 minutes, so that's cool. All right, like I said, I've already pre-weighed this solid material out because I mean, you know how to weigh stuff out, right? So basically, I will, I'll try and pour this towards you in the, in the camera view, but bear with me, I'm not left-handed. So, all right, I didn't spill anything. Yeah, what's up, I'm a dexterous or what? So um, now that we've added that in there, we want to add our 480 microliters of acetic anhydride. And this is our uh, micropipetter. As you can see, we have it set to 480. So um, that zero, uh, that's red. Sorry, let me try and focus this bad boy. There we go. That red zero is the one that we would have for the 1000 microliters. So that means we have four, eight, and then the zero at the end is not on this particular micropipetter. That's just something that we need to be aware of. And so they, the, the numbers can be adjusted with this part right here. And so you can see the dial is changing. And so that's important that we know how to kind of use this bad boy. Um, there's also, again, I've pointed this out before, but there's two points. So as you push down to withdraw the liquid, that we want so the acetic anhydride in this case you push until there's the first resistance and then you suck it up and then when you're dispensing it into the reaction vial you can actually push it a little bit harder to push it all the way down to make sure that you get all of that acetic anhydride out of the micropipetter tip okay and so that's what i will be doing right now and oof. now we are withdrawing the liquid Now I will be pushing all the way down, okay? And then I can push this part right here on the micropipetter to release the tip and place that carefully down over here. Now, what I wanna do now is go ahead and add a drop of my phosphoric acid. Just one drop because it is an acid to have catalyzed reaction and we don't need that much. So I wanna make sure I get a full drop though. So there we go. Now I set that down carefully. I'm also just uh, separating the bulb from that pipette so we don't get any chemicals in there to ruin that, plastic, that latex bulb. Now what we wanna do. So, uh, well first, we can actually put our spin vane in there. That's the triangular one. And I probably put that upside down on accident and didn't mean to drop that in yet, but that's okay. It'll still do its job. Now what we have is our air condenser. So notice there's, it's basically just an empty tube. Let's see if I can, ooh, look at through, look at that. So it's an empty tube space, that's all it is. And um, you can see this ground glass portion right here. That actually goes right into the vial. And so, uh, this little rubber, uh, this O-ring right here is what we would call it. It's a ring that we just kind of place right over that, that portion right there because this can just kind of come in and out as it pleases and we don't want that to happen during the reaction. And so we place an O-ring on there. And now when I put this vial cap down on it, as I tighten it, it pushes the O-ring down even further to better seal any kind of gaps that might happen or kind of cre be created during the heating process. And so now I can just kind of hold it right here and it's all stuck together, right? Now these, this point right here is not always perfect. And so you don't ever really want to depend on just holding it right here 
because uh, it could sometimes slip through. It depends on how big this uh, hole is right here, okay? So what I wanna do now is basically place it on the hot plate or the in the hot water bath at 50 degrees for 10 minutes. I wanna make sure that I start my 10 minutes once we get everything dissolved and kind of uh, situated on the hot plate. So I've already got a clamp on here. Now you wanna make sure that that clamp is um, going to hold the vial nice and low so that the entire reaction is submerged in the hot water bath. If it's not, you need to adjust it. So another thing is you want to make sure that it's not touching the bottom, but it's as low as possible, right? So that, that basically means you have to have enough water in it. Not sure if you can see it, but I will be turning on the hot plate now and you can see, I think you can see that it started spinning. And so we wanna make sure that we get that spin vane going um, <clears throat> to make sure that the reaction is uh, occurring as quickly as possible, but also we wanna make sure that we get all that solid dissolved. Now the reaction, uh, reactions typically occur much faster in a, in a liquid solution. And so um, that's why we do want to make sure that we get that solid material dissolved. It could occur in a, like a, a liquid solid interface, but that's much slower. And <clears throat> we ain't got time for that. We want to heat this for 10 minutes. Okay. Now, notice that these, this particular vial is placed more or less above the center of that hot plate. That's where the magnet really is spinning round and round, right? You spin me right round, magnet right round. Like an OCHEM reaction, baby, round, round. All right, sorry about that, I had to. That's, what, that's how my brain works, you know what I mean? Uh, everything is music to me, so. Um, sometimes I, I lose my, my train of thought, but sometimes I don't. Um, where was I? Oh, so basically if it's off-centered, on this side, this side, or maybe even forward or backward, then it's not going to stir very well. So if you're having problems stirring, that could be one of the issues. It could be that it's not centered on the hot plate, but it could also be that you had so much solid material in there, it almost formed a cake, and that spin vein got stuck in there, right? If that's the case, then you're gonna wanna go ahead and dislodge that with a spatula or a, spin, a stirring rod. Uh, just depends on uh, your preference, but uh, looks like everything is ni a nice homogeneous mixture, so <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and start that timer for 10 minutes. All right, all right, we're about five minutes in. Uh, reaction hasn't exploded or anything. Just kidding, it wouldn't. But you always want to make sure that you're monitoring, monitoring your reaction carefully. Make sure that the, you want to keep an eye on the level of the solvent to make sure there's no visible... carefully make sure that the, you want to keep an eye on the level of the solvent to make sure there's no visible reduction in that level if there is then maybe you have a leak you can also kind of look at all the seals make sure there's no condensation up in here condensation can occur but you don't really want it to go above like halfway I would say yeah, if it does then it might be too hot right now it actually did the temperature did go up a little bit to 60 and uh, it's supposed to be at 50, but that's okay. I just wanna, I lowered the temperature and then we'll let it keep going. Um, notice I always also did grab some ice for the ice bath, the crystallization portion, uh, as well as I set, I set up the vacuum. So this is a Hirsch funnel and that Hirsch funnel uh, has a, the filter paper inside of it already. So we're actually good to go on that front. One thing I want to point out also while we're, while we're on the topic is typically, in my opinion, you should always make sure that that uh, vacuum flask is nice and clean just in case you mess up when you're filtering your product and maybe the filter paper wasn't uh, covering all the holes and you have a lot of product that kind of went through into that filter flask or that vacuum flask. And uh, if that's the case, you want to be able to salvage that. And so the only way you can careful or like do that in a good manner is by having a clean 
flask. And if it's clean, basically all you have to do is pour it right back out. Maybe even, maybe redo the crystallization or uh, maybe just filter it right after that. And so uh, it is important for your glassware to be clean just in case uh, you have you make some mistakes. Everybody does. So we just got to make sure that we protect ourselves from our own mistakes. Okay. Now that I've got about like, I don't know, three to five minutes left, what should I do? I've kind of, I've worked ahead. I'm at a stopping point personally. So what do you think your professor does when there's a, there's a break? What do I do in the lab? We'll see at the end of the video, probably. All right, so uh, basically it's been our 10 minutes. So what we wanna do, make sure everything is all good. What we're gonna do is carefully raise this out of the heat uh, to remove it from that heat. I personally like to uh, make sure that it's nice and secure. So what I'm gonna do is um, just double check everything right here. You wanna make sure that you turn off that heat. You can also turn off the stir, might as well and let that cool uh, to the point where it can be handled. Honestly, it's really not even that hot. So what I'll probably do is place that inside of a beaker. So maybe something, something like this. It's more secure. It prevents me and my friends from knocking it down. So I'll let that hang out until it gets to room temperature, at which point we will obviously remove the condenser. We also want to remove that stir, that spin vane, and then we're going to place it in our ice bath. Okay, so go ahead and sit tight. All right, so that's definitely okay to handle. So I'm going to go ahead, unscrew this, gently twist if I need to, to take that off. Um, place that down carefully, and then we have our spin vein in there, and I want to remove that with my trusty forceps, which I made sure are nice and clean, so as not to contaminate our beautiful reaction, okay? Now, uh, this honestly feels like it's pretty cool, almost to room temperature, but I'm gonna let that hang out for another minute before I place that into my ice bath. So remember, the ice bath is to cool that even further, to uh, further reduce the solubility of the product in, uh, in the solution, okay? And so uh, the slower we let this process occur, the better our crystals will be, which means the, the more pure our product will be. So we gotta be patient. All right, so boom, ice bath. You wanna make sure that there's a, it's an ice water bath because that's going to increase the contact of the cold water bath to the conical vial. You also wanna make sure it's not gonna tip over. Um, so you can definitely place a, a clamp around that or you can just place it in a container that's not gonna allow it for to tip over, okay? So we're gonna leave that in there for uh, probably a few minutes before we observe to see if we have any crystals forming, okay? so. We should start to see some solid acetyl salicylic acid forming. If we don't, then what we're going to do is go ahead and scratch it with a um, either a spatula or a glass stirring rod to uh, create that nucleation site and induce crystallization. Sit tight. Ooh, you can't really see, but let me see if I can uh, help you. Sorry about the shakiness. Apparently, I had one too many Red Bulls at home, you know what I'm saying? A little Red Bull action, get the day going. Oof, a cinch. Look at that. Oh, looking nice. That's the start of it. We're grinding. And let's see what it look like. What it look like. Ah, uh, you can't tell. I'm gonna let that hang out in there for a hot minute. Probably while I clean up everything else. Okay, bye. All right, so now we got some lovely crystals, huh? All right, so what I did, you can see that the volume of this is actually quite high. So I added about three mils or so 
to this reaction vial so that way I could break it up. You know there's in this particular reaction we added phosphoric acid which is a catalyst so it should still be chilling in there right uh, we also added um, acetic anhydride so and that's going to form salis or i'm sorry that's going to form acetic acid and which we don't want either and so what this water is going to serve the purpose of is to kind of almost wash our product and make sure that we've got a good amount of cleaning going on here. So now I'm gonna go ahead and take this to the filter. All right, so I um, wanna make sure that my filter's on. Ooh, you can hear that, I know you can. I wanna pour a little bit of water on there first to make sure that we get the filter paper nice and stuck on there so i'm gonna go ahead and create a little suspension screw that up and then quickly pour that off quickly and carefully kind of get the rest of that material off um, okay and now what we want to do is i didn't get to show you but i kind of set aside some cold water um it's ice water and so the reason for this is because we don't want our um our, what's it called? We don't want our, we want to wash our clean product with about three or four portions of cold water. And because aspirin is soluble in water somewhat, we want to make sure that we don't dissolve our product and lose it. It's very, very possible that we will lose some in this step, but that's okay. As long as we obtain a nice clean product, and what I'm going to do now is leave that on there for about 10 minutes to let it dry. Uh, and then we can go ahead and test it, uh, the melting point, as well as our ferric chloride test. It doesn't need to be dry for the ferric chloride test, but um, I'm going to let it dry anyway. Okay, so while we're waiting for the um, salicylic, or acetyl salicylic acid, aspirin, to dry, we can do the ferric chloride test, as I said. So uh, what we're about to do here is set up three test tubes. One's going to be a control. Uh, well, I guess two of them kind of are to some extent. Uh, we're going to have one with water, about a half a mil. Um, totally estimating. I'm not the type of person that could just like eyeball. Well, maybe I can sometimes. Eyeball a half a mil. But uh, sometimes a half a mil, doesn't, it doesn't matter, really. We want to make a solution of one of them with salicylic acid. So I'll go ahead, scrape a little salicylic acid. Um, there, yeah, you can't really see. I got a tiny spatula full. Doesn't matter again. Basically, I want to get some inside of here. You can see it chilling on top. Uh, we've also got uh, water in this one. Okay, in this middle one, I'm gonna make my sample. So the middle one is uh, the one we don't want to turn purple. We also don't want the water one to turn purple. The salicylic acid does definitely turn purple and we want that to occur. So I need to make sure that this is dissolved before I do that test. And then I also need to get a spatula to get my solid material out. Okay, so let's see if we can get uh, a little bit of sample. I want to make this about the same amount of sample that I put in for the salicylic acid. So it's on a spatula. You can't really see it. Uh, maybe I'll put a little bit more just for just for good measure, as my son would say. Just because I say. And plus, uh, I have plenty in there. Um, I know it's going to take away from our yield in the end, but I don't really care that much because that's basically the source of error when we talk about it in our write-up. That's what we're going to say. Okay, so we want to make sure that that is definitely dissolved in the water. Okay, and then we can uh, get to going. Okay. I'm a little impatient, so... Let's just go ahead and get started and see what happens, okay? 
So remember, this one right here, that's salicylic acid, that's my sample, and that's just water. So we do not want um, the two, the water and my sample to turn purple. So let's go with the salicylic acid. We'll add a drop of the ferric chloride. And watch the color change. Ooh, so gorgeous. So gorgeously purple. Now, oh, snap. You can see nothing going on, nothing going on. Obviously, we still see some solid in there, but I'm mixing it in there pretty good. Uh, clearly, the the iron complex that forms the purple color is very soluble, and so uh, it would be forming if it was if we had a good amount of salicylic acid in there. You could technically get a, like a very light pink color, but it's not very obvious to me. Um, remember, this is a qualitative test, um, and so, but I mean, we can't even say that this is colored at all. So I don't know. It's almost like I do chemistry or something, and I didn't get any. Um, starting material in there so I want you to basically talk about this type this in your discussion um, what does this conclude or what does this kind of tell us in the end um, and then um, did we see what we should have seen did, what was the you also need to talk about your theoretical yield your uh, actual yield um, and then your, uh, your errors associated with the experiment, obviously my errors, um, or potential errors, we, do, we are probably gonna have a loss to that. Um, we have our theoretical yield, what was the percent yield and why was that different than 100 if it, if it was. We're gonna get a melting point, what is that melting point gonna be? Um, is it good? Is it where it needs to be compared to literature value? Um, things like that. So there's obviously more things that you can put in your lab report to discuss this experiment, but um, those are just a couple ideas. Now I feel like I want to go and take a melting point of this, okay? All right, so remember, we got to get our um, melting point apparatus set up. So let's do start temp. We probably want to bring that up to like 100, maybe even 100 and five or so just because our melting point of salicylic acid is in the 130s and so we don't want to i'm gonna do this actually 110 i'm trying to be here forever and i know that the product is pretty good pretty clear uh clean so um that's pretty much it i'm gonna go ahead and click start um start again that gets the preheat going and then once it gets up to 105 or 10 um, it's going to say ready and then we can go ahead and add our sample. So let's go make our sample. Ooh, pretty, basically. Um, smash, 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 smash. Got a little bit in there. Yeah, we got good enough. Um, now what we want to do is go ahead and tap that on the counter. And we got some down there, and so we are good to go. All right, so there it is. It says, well, ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and click melt, or start. And the, the melt light came on, and now we can see, sorry, our sample inside of that window. And we'll keep a close eye on it over time, and um, yeah, that's it. I wish I was fancy and knew how to like get two videos going on right here for you guys. I could do like this. I'll do like this. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 ba, baby, here I am. 
So I guess I should tell you guys some stuff about Melting Point. Remember, what do you? What is some uh, stuff you remember? Hopefully, um, you remember that there is a melting point depression if we have some impure samples. So, um, if we let's say we said our salicylic acid is supposed to melt around 138, then um, and it melts at like 125. Why would that be? Well, that would be because we we have a significant depression in that melting point because we had some impure sample. What could that impure what could that impurity be? It could be a variety of things. It could be starting material. It could be uh, some uh, reagents that we use to work up the reaction, such as like water or something like that. It could be acetic acid. It could be phosphoric acid, etc. So anything that had ever touched the material from the beginning to the end, that can be a source of impurity. The water would be just because of the wash of the filtration. Maybe it wasn't done long enough. <clears throat> This stuff was sitting here for quite a while, so uh, I think it'll be looking pretty good. Um, but basically, that's the melting point depression, and it's yeah, it's usually a pretty good indication of uh, of the purity of the sample. Although, just because this, the the depression occurred doesn't mean that it's like a bad impurity for example it could just be water which means we have to dry it longer and so not a big deal sorry i'm trying to like boom ba 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 well 125 i don't really see anything going on How are you guys today? You good? I'm good. It's real hot. What's up with the heat? I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. And I don't think they want to have air conditioning in this particular lab because I'm in this lab. Probably that. Or maybe it's just in general. Air conditioning is a struggle around here, so. Let's see, we're at 128.5. There it goes. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Let's see what you got here. I don't really see anything going on, folks. Not a thing. <clears throat> Ooh, maybe a little something, something on the bottom. So let's check out that 131.5 ish. It's hard to see through this camera. I'm looking at the iPad. Um, but yeah, it looks like something's going on, right? We're at 132.8 now. I want you guys to decide on what your melting point is. So. Oh, there it is. There's a temperature for you. Oh, I saw some move. There's 134.3. Well, I'll tell you when we're at 135. Okay, so we are at 135.0 now. We 135.6, oh, I'm sorry, 136, haha, <laughs> JK. And then we are at 136.5. 137, 137. And 137.5. My goodness. 138, okay. 138.5 139 139.5 and I'm gonna stop at 140 boom baby
That was a long laugh, I must say. Um, there was somebody down there. <laughs> so basically, um, that's it. It's a wrap. Go ahead and um, you don't have to watch the rest of this video. It's just for fun. So that's all the information you need. Bye. Ow. <laughs> so this is something that um, I'm going to give credit to another student, but um, it's a joke about arachidonic acid, but I got to remember it. So I mentioned that arachidonic acid kind of sounds like a dinosaur to me. Dinosaur, what's up? And then I, I kind of wanted to see what kind of people what th people could think of in terms of jokes about arachidonic acid um and somebody came up with a good one and it was um why did the why did the dinosaur take aspirin because he was brontosaurus <laughs> oh my god that's so good that's fire right there that's money I had to give credit to that student. Not gonna name the names, but uh, it's fantastic. It's a great joke. I'm sorry. Down to the Cause the way that the sky opens up when we touch it, it's making me say that the way you hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me.